Hey guys, we're back for um, section four, the West in comparative perspective. And it's if you need to keep in mind, this is important as we've learned about uh, the contraction of Christianity because of the rise of Islam. I learned about the differences in um, Byzantine Christendom and building on that Roman past. And the Western Christendom from yesterday, rebuilding on the wake of Roman collapse. So it's important to put this in a comparative perspective. And that's what Section 4 is about. Okay, so let's start with catching up. <clears throat> the hybrid civilization of Western Europe was less developed than Byzantium, China, India, or even the Muslim world. The Muslims actually regarded Europeans as barbarians, and Europeans even recognized their own backwardness. In all measures of comparison, Western Europe was behind the great civilizations of Eurasia. Visitors to Europe saw them, saw them as barbarians, and Europeans who went abroad actually realized their poverty. Uh, so, of course, Europeans were happy to exchange with or even borrow from those more advanced civilizations to the east. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, European economies reconnected with the Eurasian trading system. Uh, Europeans welcomed scientific, philo uh, philosophical, and even mathematical concepts from Arabs, classical Greeks, and in India. But the most significant borrowing was from tri uh, China. So thanks to the exposure to the outside world, uh, new trade missions reached out to the rest of the world. When the Mongols conquered the entire Silk Roads, European merchants like Marco Polo ventured all the way to China and brought back tales of wealth and uh, sophistication. So the most significant borrowing was from China. Now, Europe, it was still a developing civilization, but the others were as well. So it was a developing civilization like the others of the era. And by 1500, Europe had caught up with China and the Islamic world and even surpassed them in some areas. And the time period of 500 to 1300 was a period of great innovation for Europeans. Um, agriculture, some excellent agricultural breakthroughs. Um, the foundation for Europe's growth lay in its agricultural revolution. Um, new plows, horse harnesses, very important piece of technology, uh, and crop rotation techniques. Increased grain production, which allowed for population growth, um, and that even developed a surplus and labor specialization. Um, the new reliance on non-animal sources of energy, <clears throat> very important. Uh, wind and water mills. Europeans used wind and water mills to grind the grain, but also power the production of even crafts and goods from uh, tanned hides to even beer. So that was another part um, of this time period of great innovation for Europeans. The uh, technological borrowing for warfare, um, which led to further development. Uh, Gunpowder, as you know, comes from China, but the Europeans put a great deal of um, effort into uh, taking that a little bit further and so, the, you know, a variety of technologies came from China and India in the Arab world. And the Europeans incorporated them and then built upon them. And this is clearly seen in the development of cannons from the use of, <clears throat> or from the gunpowder. Now, the use of magnetic compasses, um, even shipbuilding with advances in sails and rudders, and the navigational techniques that allowed Europeans to start to project power overseas. And so the Europeans had a passion for technology. They wanted to make what they had better, and they wanted to take what they didn't have and use it to make, to make everything better. Um, and so with those advances in sails and rudders, um, it allowed for, uh, like especially the caravel, which um, meant that... Uh, the ship didn't have square sails, right? It had 
Instead, <clears throat> they developed triangular sails. And the tri that's the caravel. And the triangular sails uh, cut through wind a lot easier and can maneuver through water faster. So, um, and that's, <clears throat> and a lot of that is from uh, Prince Henry, the navigator of Portugal, who built that navigational school where the focus was just maritime technology. And with all of that knowledge and technology spreading throughout Europe, that's what allowed them to project power overseas, and that's what they wanted to do. They wanted to take part in what's going on in other parts of the world. <clears throat> All right, let's look at pluralism in politics. Okay. <coughs> Sorry. So, uh, Europe, well, Europe basically crystallized into a system of competing states after the fall of the Roman Empire. A bunch of different groups all over the place um, assimilating or blending, taking over, and <clears throat> this political pluralism is what shaped Western European civilization. And it led to frequent wars and militarization, um, but it also stimulated technological development, right? Wanting to have better than what your neighbor has, right? And thus, this, this, this uh, system of competing states was because there was no overall power in Europe, no central authoritative state. And so there was a system of competing states, and they struggled with each other for centuries. And these long-term conflicts created a militarized society. And within that society was a warrior elite, um, in contrast to China, where the scholar gentry ruled. Um, this technological development, that's, that, that's where the gunpowder revolution come in, comes into play. Um, this interstate competition led to increased innovations in technology and military organization, even uh, systems of state taxation to pay for that warfare and to fund um, those governmental activities. And, you know, albeit, states were able to communicate economically and intellectually with each other. Um, there was a three-way political conflict uh, developed between the heads of states, uh, the states, the church, and the nobility. And the international reach of the church in Rome and the nobles, who were jealous, guarded their wealth and their rights against their kings. And that was part of... Um, the frequent conflicts and wars. <clears throat> and, you know, it's... <clears throat> the the rulers, they were generally weaker than those to the east because of the, the royal noble ecclesiastical power struggle. Um, but that allowed merchants to gain really some independence. So... And autonomy. Um, you know, there weren't, because there were these small competing states and principalities, um, there weren't major um, written law codes, and those merchants and those companies basically, you know, operated on their own laws and rules themselves. Um, and many believe that that perhaps paved the way for capitalism. Um, and even the development of representative institutions. So, you know, new laws had to be developed because there weren't weren't many laws written, um, especially in, in the areas of trade, um, and to deal with international um, issues. And that led to uh, systems like parliament, uh, parliamentary governments. All right, reason and faith. Um, distinctive intellectual tension existed between faith and reason, and it developed during this time. Uh, intellectual life flourished in the centuries after 1000. Um, we see the creation of uh, universities, 
from the earlier cathedral schools. And scholars had some intellectual freedom at how they taught and what they taught at those universities. In the early years of Christianity, Greek philosophy was part of the explanation of understanding faith. However, with the post-Roman decline, access to these texts and ideas was lost. So there's a break from that connection to Greek thought. And so that's where this uh, freedom of, you know, how they taught intellectually uh, to those students comes into play here. Um, in the university, some scholars began to emphasize the ability of human reason to understand divine mysteries. And they also applied reason to law and medicine and the world of nature. And so we see the development of natural philosophy or the scientific study of nature. So stemming from the tradition of church schools and universities, they established these, uh, that were established in various cities. Um, and they, they maintain a high degree of independence and intellectual freedom and a new interest in rational thought develops. And with the growth of these universities came a new interest in applying reason to explain the world and to explain the Christian faith. And this was first seen in subjecting theology to critical inquiry and later rational inquiry was applied to the natural world. And then there was the search for the Greek texts, um, especially those of Aristotle. Uh, they were eventually found in Byzantium in the Islamic world. And about the 12th through 13th centuries, that's when Europeans really gained access to this ancient Greek and Arab scholarship. Um, as contact with the Byzantine and Arab world grew with the Crusades, there was a growing desire to get the original source material. And scholars got a hold of texts from centers of learning in these cultures. And direct access to the texts, like I said, spurred further study and the development of philosophical activity. <clears throat> now, Aristotle had a deep impact on European thought. His writing, writings were the basis of university education, and it, his writings essentially dominated European thought between 1200 and 1700. But there was no similar development in the Byzantine Empire. Um, the focus of education was the humanities, and they were even suspicious of classical Greek thought. Uh, you know, with the comparisons of the Byz of Byzantium and the Islamic world, you know, the, the Byzantines had many Greek texts. Um, they were not interested in natural philosophy. Uh, like I said, they focused on the humanities. There was also, uh, sus or they were sp suspicious of the pagan roots of much of that learning. And in the Muslim world, many Greek texts were translated into Arabic, but debates arose regarding whether reason was an aid or a threat to faith. And the Islamic world had a deep interaction with that Greek, classical Greek thought. Um, massive amounts of translation in the 9th and 10th centuries. And this actually encouraged a flowering of Arab scholarship and learning between 800 and 1200. Um, like I said, there's there were many debates regarding whether reason was an aid or even a uh, threat to uh, faith. Um, and the Islamic world eventually turned against natural philosophy. <clears throat> okay. Oh, I love this image. It's, oh, it's great. Um, here we have a picture. And let's describe this. <clears throat> so let's look at the scene here. Now, who are the people? What type of building are they in? What's going on here? Okay. 14th century manuscript painting here shows a lecture hall in the University of Bologna, idiot, Italy. Uh, to the left, behind a tall lectern, sits so a lecturer He's got a long beard and a robe. In front of him and to his side 
are rows of benches and desks where mostly men and maybe two or three women sit in long robes, some of them with books before them. So let's look at the position of the speaker on the left, even the shape of the windows. Do they remind you of something? The lecturer's elevated seat and the conic shape of the window tops resemble the architecture of a church. Well, this is no accident. Early European universities of the Middle Ages, like we talked about earlier, grew out of cathedral churches. So what aspects of this scene remind you of university classes today? What aspects would be different in a university lecture hall today? <laughs> Well, the depiction of some of the students uh, seeming to have fallen asleep, <laughs> while others have turned to one another in conversation, that's a familiar scene today, isn't it? <laughs> uh, but professors no longer sit in elevated pulpits. Uh, many of them move about the room. Um, however, uh, you know, that ecclesiastical style of the building and gathering would be a conflict, you know, the modern notion of higher education as being secular as opposed to religious. Of course, there are still religious institutions today. Uh, but some, you know, good food for thought there. <laughs> That's funny, this guy over here sleeping. Talking with each other. What's going on? No, it's not much difference. <laughs> and that is the end of section four. I'll see you for reflections.